All right. Hello, everyone. It's time to get started as, as, as the clock, clock hits 12. Uh, so my name is Asmo Urpilainen, so I'm the director of product development for Friends. Most of you might might know me know me already. So welcome again for the for this session of, of the of the Friends webinar series, uh, where we're going to be taking a look at uh, how to modernize legacy systems and one use case in particular in this case. And uh, this this time the the webinar is going to be more of a technical deep dive. So what we're going to be doing is actually. Uh, going to be walking through a case where we actually want to expose some insurance data API and imagine that we have a really old legacy system that's actually containing the the insurance insurance system or the insurance data uh, as is and uh, we're going to be taking a look at a couple of different uh, steps that we need to take in order to actually be able to wrap this legacy system or imaginary legacy system in this case in an API and modernize access towards that legacy system. And there are going to be a couple of kind of key points that, that we'll be covering here uh, during the during the webinar. So we only have one hour, so we're going to be uh, quite speedy this time. So actually, because we're going to be building uh, actually two different APIs and the backend processes for those and find out how and what sort of things should we take into account when dealing with these sorts of kind of modernization projects where the, of course the goal is to simplify and, and control the access towards some system or data that might not be able to provide these sorts of access in the form of APIs for example uh, natively and we're going to be using friends to kind of uh, create this layer uh, between the legacy system and then for example it might be a mobile application uh, consuming the consuming the data or just another application development project uh, in general so any of these scenarios might be something that 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 you could take advantage of in in today's webinar but to kind of maybe look at the case here in a little bit more deeply before we kind of get started so the end goal of what we're trying to build here uh, is like I like I like I talked earlier is to build an API. So we have the API actually actually ongoing here, and 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 I have kind of a working copy of the of the kind of final product. But we're going to be kind of duplicating this uh, step by step, pretty much uh, during the webinar here. So you can all kind of get the get get a better understanding on 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 the steps required and the kind of uh, key points to note. When, when trying to build something like this. So if the finished end product that we're going to be kind of looking at today would be to actually have an API like we have here, where pretty much we're able to curate different sorts of uh, insurance data data requirements. So uh, the, the finished end product will, be, will basically have two different API endpoints. And of course, in your real life scenarios, these endpoints might vary and you might have a lot more than two but just for the sake of clarity, we've kept this at a, at a minimum to kind of demonstrate on, on how you can get started in these sorts of situations. So the first API we have here is basically a simple list of to retrieve all insurance records as a list from the legacy system or the legacy data as we're going to be kind of talking about in a, uh, in a, in a moment there. Uh, and pretty much it's just the policy ID of that uh, insurance policy and the value of that 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 insurance policy ID in, in general and and don't pay too much attention on the on the actual data itself because the data of course will will vary on on, on your situation and then and depending on what you're actually going to be building and and the system that that hosts the data itself but the ideology here is that we have a simple API to get the list of insurance data and then we have a second API where we can now actually query a single insurances uh, kind of closer information or, or or the actual insurance data itself. So in this case, it's just going to be uh, the insurance value, insurance de deductible, and from which state and, and county that insurance policy was actually kind of cashed in. And of course, you can kind of switch around these these numbers here to get a get a different result here uh, each time and, and kind of find out each of the different insurance insurance ID or, or data that we have going on there. Uh, and the basis of our API, so if this is kind of the desired end product that we're kind of aiming for is to have this API that now pretty much you could utilize in any sort of a project uh, when dealing with the, with the insurance system or any sort of Azure system that you might have 
uh, in a similar fashion. So the basis of this is actually now quite simple. So if you're looking to expose this API in the cloud, so currently actually I have, it, I have this API hosted, hosted on the cloud and had that this particular address. And actually, if you want to, uh, you can call this address yourself. You can, you can go to this address uh, and actually call the API yourself. It should be kind of completely working and functional uh, as it is. But the interesting part is when we actually get to the kind of legacy side here and, and kind of start thinking about where does this data actually now come from uh, uh, towards our API. So in our case here, we've actually kind of simplified things uh, a little bit, little bit, little bit further or a little bit more than, than, than usually maybe. But the uh, ideology is that, that most legacy systems nowadays are either some sort of a database combination. So there might be even uh, mainframe databases or uh, they might be kind of file based or they might have some sort of a legacy interface that you would need to connect towards. And the, 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 the term legacy here is applied to situations where the system hasn't been designed to handle, for example, frequent input uh, or frequent requests in the form of API calls, for example. So this means that in our example here, uh, what we're going to be looking at is actually having the insurance data in a simple CSV format. So there's something like 30,000 different uh, different insurance rows here, which pretty much have all the data that we need stored in a single CSV file, which is now actually lo locally uh, located on my computer here, which I'm actually uh, hosting this webinar from. So this is my actually my my home PC. So as we can see now that the, <laughs> that the insurance data in this case is stored in a CSV file and the problem here and, and why we're kind of thinking about modernizing legacy systems that if you have a similar situation that you have a system that is producing, let's say this sort of an insurance record file or any sort of a file in, in this case, the, the file system of, of most, <laughs> most <laughs> newer and, and even older uh, older servers aren't kind of designed to handle multiple different parallel requests and the throughput that would be required of an, of an API providing basically the same data as we have here in the, form, in, in the CSV format isn't just feasible if the, if the data source is a file. So now you need to actually build the, the integration layer in between that takes care of that problem. So basically, first of all, uh, we want to transform this data into something that we can curate so we can actually get a single insurance row from that data uh, out and put that actually into use in our API. And also we want to make sure that, that, that we're caching the data as efficiently as possible to prevent the legacy problem from kind of showing up. So the legacy problem in this case would be the throughput of the system. And in this case, in this particular case, it would be the throughput of the file system. So since you can't be reading from that file uh, as much as API requests would actually be required. So if you imagine that we have a hundred requests going on every second, then of course the API should be able to handle that no problem. But if we try to read the same file hundreds of times a second, uh, the file system can't just, can't just, just simply can't keep up because it's not designed to be able to accommodate that. And the same logic here applies even if the, even in, in, the, in, in other cases than, than files. So you might have a case where uh, you might have some sort of an interface such as let's, let's just think of an IBM mainframe, for example, where uh, it's not exactly files, but members, and you need to use uh, TCP protocol to actually read stuff from the files, but the same problem, kind of underlining problem, is exactly the same as is with, with, a, with a tra more traditional file, is that the system isn't just simply capable of, of handling the amount of uh, traffic or the amount of uh, data that we would require it to in order for us to actually kind of read from the file in, in real-time scenarios. So this means that what we're going to be taking a look at is actually how to now make our insurance data available through these couple of different APIs and how are we actually caching the data? So how are we taking care of that performance aspect? How are we providing curability? So an ability for us to actually now search through the data to find some specific, uh, some, some spe specific insurance 
record records there and also how to now kind of transform and transport the data from our kind of local on-premise system or in my case my my local pc here uh, into the cloud and so that it, now it's actually accessible through our api so if this is the kind of groundwork on, on what we're going to be starting starting to to, to build from and here is the kind of finished end product that that we're going to be trying to achieve here and like i said i do have a kind of a working copy of this now here to kind of guide us along but we're not going to be taking that close of a look at the actual actual finished implementation except at the at, uh, at the end there uh, but rather what we're trying to, uh, gonna be doing is actually building the whole thing from scratch to kind of get you the, the, the best understanding possible on, on how to actually now implement similar situations or implement these sorts of legacy modernization projects. So the first thing that you would need to do in any sort of a similar situation such as this is actually go in and define the API itself that we, we would like to be publishing. So the first thing, also, of course, it has is, as is with the case with in any API or or legacy modernization or integration projects in general is that you need to have some sort of a specification to kind of go forward. And in our case, uh, we're going to be using the Swagger specification to basically specify the sort of API that we would like to publish as our kind of first step in, in, the, in the development flow in this case. So in our case here, uh, it's a fairly simple API and we I won't go into too much detail on, on how the kind of Swagger specification works as I'm kind of assuming that uh, you've been a part of our, our previous webinars where we've covered the, the API portion in a little bit more, more detail. And of course, you, we can have links available to, to those uh, to those previous sessions, sessions as well, or you have looked through our documentation and kind of uh, found out how the API management functionality works in France and how you can actually de define the sort of API that you would like to be, start working on. But we can kind of now take the basis here and, and kind of cheat a little bit and basically just create a copy of the existing API that I just kind of or I had defined previously. So pretty much we are going to only thing we're going to change here uh, is going to be the API base path. So we're going to call this our version two of the same insurance data API and reset the version version there back to back to zero and maybe change the title to have the V2 there as well. But pretty much the only thing that we've defined here, defined here in our Swagger specification is that we have two different APIs for getting different sorts of data from our insurance data. But of course, we could have data to update an insurance row or uh, similarly to insert a new insurance record or whatever the case might be, deleting a record from the same file, which would follow exactly the same logic as we're going to be building for the kind of data requests here. And pretty much then the only thing that's going to be important is to define the data format that we are going to be exposing outside. So the data format would be the data or the format of the data that we are returning out from our API. And now this is, of course, something that's uh, wholly dependent on the data that you have available. And actually, in, in many real life scenarios or, or in your cases, you might have multiple different files, for example, rather than just one like I have here. And then, of course, you need to kind of take into account all of the different data that you have there. But in my case here, I've pretty much just picked out a couple of fields from our insurance data set here. So, for example, the policy code, the state code, the county, uh, the actual insurance value and so on and kind of simplified that a little bit into our this sort of uh, into our uh, five property message that we're going to be returning from our uh, from our API for our for our consumers but the data is pretty much uh, exactly based on the source data of the legacy system I've just specified some typing for the data to make it more accessible and easily consumable with some some examples there uh, as you can see but if we now kind of get to the point that now we have our first API specification going on, and this doesn't, of course, mean that we have our APIs ready. We simply have the first step of the development there kind of finished with the API specification. 
And once we have our API specification where we are happy with it, we can actually see that now we have two different uh, uh, endpoints here available where we would be able to create now the kind of back end for our API and start building the, 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 the functionality or the, the back end functionality of our, of our API. But before we actually do that, uh, there's the simple kind of issue here that, that if you've been a part of our previous uh, previous uh, webinars, you might remember how Friends works with the agent ideology, where we can deploy the agents into different locations. And for example, like we have here in our test environment, uh, I have one agent which is running in the cloud and one agent which is now running uh, locally on my PC, like we kind of discussed there a little bit earlier. Uh, we need to now first specify which parts of the API's backend we want to execute on which agent. So because now in our case, what we, actually, what we want to do is actually publish the API from the cloud endpoint, but have the data be retrieved here from my uh, on-premise or, or own local server in, in this case. Uh, the first step the, there would be to now provide access to that data, to the insurance data here, uh, locally on my PC. And the way that we are going to do, you know, going to be doing that is that you might be familiar with the mini service ideology of friends, where we can now create this sort of a reusable component to actually get the mini service data or get the get insurance data locally, cache it, and maybe pro further process it in some manner. And then we can, we're going to be able to use that component that's going to be getting the data locally as the backend for our API. So then we're going to be able to create the kind of hybrid implementation where part of the uh, functionality is now executed directly in the cloud, so in the backend of this API, and part of the functionality is now going to be executed here locally on, on my PC when actually dealing with the, with the, with the API itself. So the, to get started on this, this kind of path, the first thing we would need to do is go into the kind of sub-processes view here and create a new sub-process. So we're going to be calling our sub-process uh, legacy uh, dash, let's call this get insurance, insurance data, uh, just to be as simple as, or as uh, easy as power, as understandable as possible. Uh, but now what we actually want to do here is uh, build the specification or, or design the, uh, the integration functionality that's going to be responsible for reading the legacy data, caching it, and transforming that from the CSV format into something more manageable that then we're going to be able to use uh, back up in the cloud when we actually move that data to the cloud. So the first step that we would, of course, like to be doing there. And this is kind of a similar pattern for all of these sorts of cache implementations when we are dealing with these sorts of legacy systems is that we would of course first like to check if the data is already available for us in the uh, friends cache format. So I'm probably going to be just looking or searching here in our task uh, list or task library for the friends cache task, which basically means that I have two different options here. So I have a task to get data from a, from a cache or put data to the cache. So as the first step of our insurance data kind of uh, implementation here, I wanna actually check that I wanna get data from cache. And the only thing I need to specify here is the cache key. So because we're fur further down the line in a moment when we're gonna be actually reading the contents of our CSV file and putting that into the, into the cache, we need to know from which key we can actually access that data later on. So in this case, I'm just gonna simply call it insurance data, let's see, call it zero one, just to be on the, on the safe side. So uh, now that we are kind of, uh, can know that if the insurance data is already cached, we can now get the data directly from the agent's memory that's now running here locally on my, my PC here, or of course it could be on your own on-premise server. And if the data is there stored in the memory of the agent, we can directly access that with, with no delay. 
But the first thing we need to, of course, do is check if the data was indeed cached or if it was uh, not cached. So yeah, the data might have refreshed or we're going to be taking a look at a little bit later on how to invalidate, for example, the, the, the cache here. So if we have a such situation where, for example, the system is generating a new insurance file for us or the issuer's database in that sense, uh, that sense how can we actually now uh, redeploy or refresh that data into the cache there? But to check if the data is actually in the cache uh, is a fairly straightforward uh, process. So let's just call this, this step here, uh, or, or was the data available in the cache like that? And I'm going to move it to the to the top top of the shape there because that's how I like it. But the uh, or the easiest way to go about this is basically now that we we're reading data from the cache. What we want to check is that if the result of that reading data from the cache, and we can actually specify that there. Uh, if that's actually oh wait is this it's actually this way around I think. Oh no wait it's. Uh, my apologies, I, I have a horrible memory when it comes to that, that sort of a detail. But what we want to actually do is make sure that, the, that if the data from the cache, if it's not null, so if we get anything other than empty basically back from the cache, we are fairly happy with that. And we want to return that data straight out to the consumer of our mini service call here. So whoever, whomever might be consuming our mini service, uh, we just want to return that data directly out. Uh, but before we actually do that, uh, it might be easier to now think of the architecture here a little bit, because in many of these kind of legacy cases here, uh, the amount of data that we actually uh, have available here uh, can be quite large. So because we have something like 30,000 30, rows of data there in the, in the CSV format, we might actually want to do something like uh, first transform that data locally here on my PC into something more manageable before sending it kind of upwards towards the cloud. Or we might even want to uh, drop down some data out to further kind of improve the performance even after the, the caching uh, before we send that data towards the cloud. So just to kind of keep this thing, thing simple here, uh, let's just do a simple step here where let's just parse the data. So parse the CSV into JSON, JSON data. So then we have the option of, of manip manipulating the data here locally uh, at the on-premise server before moving on to the cloud. And the way that we do that is pretty much by dropping in the, the, the task for the parse CSV step and the CSV that we're going to be providing for our parsing is actually now going to be the result of the previous step. So it's going to be getting the data from the cache in that case that the cache actually found some data that we, we, we are able to actually now process. So, but now, and after that, we just specify that the limiter for our CSV data was a comma. Let's be sure. Yeah, it looks like it's a, it's a comma. And let's check that the yeah, it does have a header row. We could also set the header row to be nothing, or we could actually specify the the columns or the the data formats ourselves. But I'm just gonna be lazy here and let the let the task handle that for me by setting the the header row there. And let's trim the output. That seems 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 something something that we want to do. And actually, uh, let's keep empty rows. So if the data actually had some rows which are uh, completely empty, we just do nothing, nothing with that. And then the only thing we want to say is that after we've successfully gotten the data from the cache, if the data was available and we parse the data into CSV, uh, we just want to re return that JSON data uh, out to the consumer of the mini service. So let's call this parse CSV into, uh, let's, let's say, into JSON data. And the only step that we want to do here is simply refer back to the parse CSV into JSON data and say that actually uh, we want to get what, what's known as to JSON conversion there. So pretty much 
saying that uh, we want to get JSON a kind of a, a JSON format out of the CSV conversion here and return that outside to the to the consumer of the of the of the mini service. But what about now the the second step? So if the data is not available, now we need to specify the the kind of alternative path here. So if the data wasn't available for our cache there, what we actually want to do is read the data now from the file here. So we could call that the kind of uh, getting the actual data from the system itself. So now if you had some other system than just a file, or if you had multiple files, this is where you'd actually now be building the logic on how to now gather the data in the first place uh, as a part of our, our kind of modernization project here. But in our case, it's gonna be fairly simple where we can just say that we simply read a file from a specific location and the file's name is gonna be the, the Florida insurance sample.csv. And then the only st step is gonna be, or the next step is gonna be to uh, actually say that now we have, as we have read the data from the file, what we wanna do is now go back to the cache task. And now instead of getting data from the cache, we wanna put some data to the cache. And in this case, we need to specify the same cache key as previously. So now, because if we're checking to see if this sort of a, a data set exists in our cache, uh, we, and when we are now updating or putting the data to the cache, we want to use the same key uh, to make sure that we're kind of aligning up there and not messing with some other data or some other uh, caching that might be going on relating to some other integrations than the insurance one that we are building, building here. And in addition to that, we simply specify that the content that we want to put to the data or the, the cache is now the result of the read file step. So the contents of the file that we just read. And then we simply say that the cache expiration, uh, let's say, let's set this to be, for example, 6,000 seconds. But of course, here's a number that you need to give so the cache doesn't live basically forever. And a good practice here is maybe to hold the cache a couple of days or maybe from a couple of hours to a couple of days, depending on the, of course, the the use case on how real time you need the data, data to be. And later down the line, we're going to be taking a look at on how to now actually uh, make the uh, or invalidate the cache or update the cache outside of our process here uh, when there might be some sort of need to manually, for example, refresh the data. Or in the case that if some of the data gets updated here, we could now automatically update the cache, cache as well. But now that we, put, we have put basically inserted the data into the cache, the next step we want to do is make sure that the data is now actually available. So we want get, to get the data from the cache again, and again use the same insurance data cache key here to access the same data set. And if that's the case, the only thing that we want to do now is now pass that back to the par CSV just like we would have basically come from the top route, but now we just read and put the data to the cache before we go back into the uh, parsing of the, of the data into the J, uh, J, uh, CSV or, or JSON format there. And pretty much that's it. So if we go ahead and save our example process here, so it, the get insurance process here, uh, we can now deploy that to locally my PC here. So if we deploy that to the local test environment, and we can see that now we have the get insurance data version here available. And if we actually run that now, it's going to be now reading the data directly here from my folder, like we specified. And then we're going to be actually be able to see uh, if we did everything correctly. So okay, so actually, what we can what we can do here is go in here and see that actually we had an we had an error here saying that that when we were trying to get the data from the cache there was no data out for, or data that we we got out from the cache and if the data was available in the cache uh, or wasn't available what we wanted to do is actually read the file but actually we got an error message saying that the process cannot access the file 
uh, because it's being used by another process. And that's actually my bad because uh, the insurance data sample that we, we just looked at was being actually in use of, of my previous example here. So the clever thing about the kind of caching mechanism here as well is that uh, if you want to, you can actually have friends kind of lock that uh, data in place while we are now kind of reading that. So to actually work around that and not break my existing example there, let's call this uh, our insurance sample one instead of the insurance sample and go back into our, our example here and change our path, file path here to the insurance sample one.csv rather than the, the existing one. So let's update that uh, our, our, our mini service call there uh, deploy that to the local test environment like previously, go back to the local test environment, see that, okay, the version has updated. Let's run that once and go in here. And any moment now, the instances have changed. And now we should have an existing successful instance here where we can see that, okay, now actually we went down the same route. So we tried getting the data from the cache, nothing. So then we read the contents of the file. So when we have the, so there we have the result of the CSV. So then we actually put that data into the cache and then get the same data out to make sure that the data is now actually in the cache. And then we simply pass that data into the CSV parser, which, which now produces the kind of standardized format for us uh, for of the CSV data. And finally, we just transform that into a JSON format that we are now able to actually process in, in some reasonable manner within friends. And now the interesting bit here is that now if you can see that, okay, we, we went down the getting the data from the cache because it wasn't available. But if we actually go back here and uh, run our kind of mini service call again. So this would now be demonstrating, for example, what would happen in an API uh, case when the, this mini service would be consumed. Uh, now we are actually, because we do have the data now in the cache available, available for us. So now we're actually able to get uh, the whole data set in just two milliseconds, basically, from the cache and directly parse that into JSON data uh, based on the CSV and output that uh, to, the, to the consumer of the mini service. And now, of course, I think many of you can actually now figure out that you could further optimize this if you moved the parsing of the JSON data actually to be a part of the read file set up here and then storing, storing the kind of JSON data instead of storing now the CSV data. And there are all sorts of these uh, kind of cool little optimizations that you can start building uh, on top of the, the legacy system here. But for our case, our use case here, this is plenty good enough when we are now not actually reading anything from the legacy system or the file and we are just accessing directly from memory. So we're easing off the burden for the legacy system rather than ramping it up and, and perhaps making it crash in, in some way or, or form. But now that we're fairly happy with our uh, mini service call here, where we can now actually get our uh, insurance data out and we could actually just run that a couple more times and see that, oh, nice, it's, it's working nicely. Uh, we're getting the data out, uh, the, the data out that we actually want to get out. So now the next step would be to now hooking that uh, API call that we created in the first step. So if we remember, we def defined our insurance da data version two API here. So now what we actually wanna do is hook these APIs into that mini service that's now responsible for caching and getting the data from the mini server or from the, from the CSV or the legacy system and exposing that to the outside world. So to get started on that, let's click the create new process for the uh, insurance data uh, data process and we get kind of uh, instantly put into this kind of a template where basically we have uh, specified now that the trigger endpoint where somebody calling the API is now actually coming or, or the message coming in will be going to the start node here and then we have the end node where we now actually need to provide the the finished end result or the the final 
uh, the final uh, API uh, end result to the to the consumer of the of the API. And actually, uh, I'm just looking at the clock to save some time. Let's take the more difficult use case here first. So uh, let's actually go straight into rather than getting all of the data. Let's just start, jump straight into getting a single insurance record of, of, from the data uh, and looking at how we can actually now query the data in the inside friends here. So it's exactly the same that what we want to be doing here is that we know that there's going to be a specific sort of a message coming in that's going to be containing the insurance ID. And we want to use that insurance ID to basically now find a specific row in our cached CSV data and transform that specific row's data into a format that matches now with our specification and makes it nice, more or super nice for, so for example, a front-end developer to access that, that insurance data there. So the first thing that we need to, of course, do is specify that we wanna call the mini service that we just de de defined. So we wanna call the legacy get insurance data mini service, and we wanna call it in the local test environment. So we would drag and drop our mini service call here and select the, uh, I think that we call it legacy and we call it get insurance data. And we wanna also specify that this is gonna be a, a remote call, meaning that no matter where we are now actually exposing this API, we always wanna get the data here uh, for the insurance data should always be executed here locally on my PC, because that's the only place that we have the uh, insurance data, of course, available. So in this case, I'm going to select the local test and the ground prod environment. And now the local test environment, if you remember, is my local PC here, which all, of course, now has access to the CSV data here, uh, like we previously uh, went through there. And now that would be the, the first step of the, of the API. And we can probably pretty much, uh, if we are kind of want to take the short route out, we could just return all of that data now directly uh, to the consumer. But that would be kind of defeat the purpose here a little bit, because now if we go ahead and take a look at our insurance data uh, execution here, we know that it's going to be returning a whole bunch of different uh, different uh, API calls here or different insurance rows. So what we want to do is actually find the specific row based on the insurance ID that, that we are interested in, in in this particular case. And actually, I need to cheat here a little bit because my, my memory isn't, isn't what, it, what it used to be. So if we go in here and actually uh, check out, the, or I'm going to copy a couple of different steps here and explain what these steps pretty much do. So and actually, let's get rid of that and put that there. So what we want to do is actually first uh, assign the insurances to a variable that we're going to be using later down the line. So now that we're getting the data, so the insurance data, so if you remember from our instance here, this data that we have available, we're first assigning that to a variable called insurances, and then we are finding the specific insurance. And in this case, what we're actually doing is writing a simple link queue query. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with link queue, but it's a, it's a language syntax that Microsoft basically has developed on curing any sort of data that you might have available. And because in Friends, we have kind of complete access to all of the .NET framework uh, components and kind of language on, and encoding practices, the easiest way to get the specific data set now from the legacy data that we have provided is to write a simple link queue query, which looks a little bit like SQL, where we can now say that the insurance data that we are actually want to kind of return out, so push out from the, from the, uh, uh, from the final end product to our uh, API consumer uh, is actually now formed based on the variable insurances. And the variable insurances is now, of course, a direct reference 
to the data from our existing process or mini service call here to get and cache the insurance data. And then we simply specify just like we would in an SQL query, but except this time it's a, it's a link queue query. We say that for each insurance in the insurance data set, we want to find uh, that there's a field called policy ID. So the policy ID field here in the data and the policy ID field should now match the insurance data ID that we are getting from the trigger. So as the input for our API here, we want to now filter or find the specific row where the policy ID data now matches our insurance ID that we're getting here. And then of course, we are just saying select that insurance where we are matching that data. And just like in SQL for, and I highly recommend that you kind of look, look link you up if you haven't, haven't already, there are plenty of guides and, and, and interesting interesting demonstrations on what, what you can do with link you. But because it's this sort of an syntax uh, which kind of resembles SQL, we can also do all sorts of cool, cool things like say, just and, but now you have to do it in a code format. So you have to say and, and. And now you could also say that if the insurance has, let's say, let's take another, uh, another data format here. So we might also say that the state code uh, must always be now Florida in this case, or whatever the query might be. And of course you can use these and and or operators both to build the sort of a query that you're looking for. So you can kind of think of this step as, as uh, curing the data, which is now stored in the memory of friends, where we have now first read the data and transformed that into JSON and then cached that JSON data, which is now stored in the memory of the agent. Now we want to kind of execute an SQL like a data, almost like a database query to that data to get our specific, <laughs> specific uh, insurance here out. And then of course, the, the final thing to do here uh, would be to of course, just do the mapping to, to, the, to our, <laughs> our, our desired end, end product here. So if we go back into, into our version two example here, where we're finding and getting our insurance data out. And now we have of course here, our hard coded values, so our dummy values. So the only thing we need to do now is replace that with the kind of standard mapping tech or mapping kind of ideology of friends, where we're now saying that uh, because after finding the specific insurance uh, based on our link you query, we want to store that insurance data in a variable called insurance. So you can think of it as a single entity in this list of insurances. And now in this list of insurances, we have all of the different data here available. So what we want to do is say that, for example, now the uh, end result of our API call, which has the policy ID parameter, that that policy ID parameter should now be uh, mapped from that insurance variable that we have just assigned for that one, tic one particular specific insurance. And we want to get the first result that we find there. And in that data, uh, we want to use the policy ID uh, data here. And of course, you can now do all of the kind of standard friends mapping, mapping technology that you would do. So you could add, let's say, padding zeros, or you could add underscore ASD, or uh, you could even divide the policy ID by, let's say, 60 if you wanted to. And anything that you might think of, or you could combine the policy ID with some other data to create that kind of desired end result here. And of course, now, if you had a real scenario where you might be getting insurance data, but you might also be getting, let's say, some sort of uh, other data here as well. So rather than insurance data, you might uh, want to get, let's say, uh, let's call get here, for example, uh, ex existing product stock information or <laughs> get let's say, getting a product information from some other, other API or any other mini service call that you might have that you want to now combine that data with some other data. But in our case, what we're doing is simply mapping that uh, our uh, JSON data or our CSV data based on the CSV or the source system in this case, 
and map that to be, for example, that the EQ site deductible uh, CSV column should be now mapped to the insurance deductible parameter in our finished end result to the when we're calling the calling the outside world. So that's pretty much it for our uh, first example here. So if we now actually go ahead and create a new process and activate that. So that means that now we have our nice simple single API here available. And because we already now know that in the local test environment, we do have access to the insurance data. So if we go in here, we could see that, that that's yay, it works. Our, our data is flowing through our mini service component here. Uh, the only thing that we would like not now like to do is actually take our insurance data version two and deploy that API to the cloud test environment. And now it's actually noting that uh, you're, you're using uh, the subprocess or mini service component called the legacy get insurance data. And it's making sure that that's available with the same version that I've specified in my API here. And when I deploy that to our, our, our cloud test agent, uh, it's now available for me to consume uh, basically our single API endpoint here from the cloud. And if we now actually try this out, so we can actually even cheat here a little bit. So we can go into the source data here and just take, let's say that, <laughs> that row and that insurance ID and click execute. And now we actually uh, wanna jump in here and see what's actually happening in our API call here. So let's find our <laughs> insurance data version two. And here is our insurance data version two. So basically our insurance call that we just made, but let's jump in here to see actually now, now exactly what happened. So the first thing of course, is that, that now we, we, called our, we called our API and the uh, parameter that we gave was the, was the same as in our Excel here. So the one, one eight five, four, eight, three. And we now uh, went to the mini service call. So now actually we, rather than getting the data or reading the data directly here from the file, what we actually did was get the, or got the data directly from the cache and transform that data into the JSON result. And if we jump back to the kind of parent execution, uh, the first thing we did was with that we assigned that data to a variable called insurances. And then we did a query against that insurances list, uh, where we basically said that the policy ID should match the one that we're given here in the trigger. And then we end up with a single insurance and we mapped that data to basically our finished end result for our, for our API call here. So basically, uh, that means that now if we wanted to, we could, let's take another one. So let's just, just test this out. So this should now be in, in Florida and St. John's County, if we want to get this, this data out. So if we change that up, we can see that, ah, nice. Here we got the, the policy or the information for the policy ID 340883 or whatever, but it's in Florida and, and then the county, uh, St. John's County. So this would now pretty much kind of conclude the basic setup where you can get started. And of course, the next steps here uh, would be to kind of further refine the whole process. So that would mean that you might want to secure access to the API using the friends uh, API management functionality or API keys. Uh, you might want to create more of the different endpoints to access your data in different various, various different ways. You can pretty much uh, whatever you can think of can be quite easily implemented. And because then you're just using the link you query here to specify how do you want to now search the data here uh, that, that we have that we have available for for accessing. And then you might actually want to go one step further here. And if you remember previously in the or when we did our uh, get insurance data mini service here, where we are now actually can see that we are getting the data from the file and caching it. And actually here, you, you're actually able to ni ni nicely see now as well that, that 
who has now consumed our mini service call here because we created that that earlier but if you remember now that uh, when we created our uh, caching and, and file reading functionality here and you remember how we specified that we want to get the data based on the specific insurance cache key we might actually want to do on kind of kind of go one step further and actually create a process here which is now based or triggered based on a change to a file so in the in the case of a file this is fairly straightforward where we could say that uh, we are we are looking at the kind of legacy directory and we want to be looking at uh, this particular .csv file here and what we actually want to do that we want to uh, update cache based on file change so now what we're saying is that whenever this file is now either deleted edited or overwritten or anything like that uh, what we want to actually now do is update the cache that that has our uh, insurance data uh, in it so that means that now if the, we can create this kind of a fully dynamic link between the legacy system that for example would be creating this file when a user presses generate report or uh, it might be on a schedule to, to generate this sort of uh, data for us or any other sort of a scenario that you might think of but now what we want to do is we want to actually be taking a look at at, at these all of these files in the direct directory and actually let's change it so that we can now include uh, all of our insurance samples not just the one but the only thing that we want to now do is say that we want to read a file and the file that we actually want to read is now coming from the trigger and the trigger now has our file paths data they are available and we want to take the first file that matches our our file path trigger there and then the only thing that we want to do is actually go back to our cache uh, task here and use the same cache key here so the insurance data 01 cache key and say that all right now if any of the files are updated we read the contents of that file and we put that uh that data to the cache here so we might now do exactly the same thing as we are doing here on the lower branch of our of our mini service anyway so we just simply refer back to the read file and say that that expires in 6000 seconds and that's pretty much it so now what we're actually able to do is have this dynamic refreshing of the cache based on the actual source data on the of the files so now if we have our update cache based on file change and we deploy that to our local test environment like so and go in c and see here that it's activating the trigger so it's registering now access for the file and actually it now ran the first time when it registered the, or it noticed that it we had two different files and it now actually uh, invalidated it or, or actually reread the file and put the contents of that file into the cache here. So basically, we put now the contents of the of the file that we we, we triggered that. So the uh, insurance sample one dot csv. But now, if we imagine a, a situation where uh, a user is now using some sort of a legacy system and he clicks export, let's say insurance data. And the legacy system produces now a new CSV file. So the new CSV file, let's actually do it like this, where I can uh, easily edit it before breaking something. So this should be called temp. And let's put it here and change that to be now number two. So if we imagine now that the legacy system would be producing the, the next file in the series, so that would be the file number two. We can see that any moment now that should, or actually did it run already? <laughs> I think it might. So 54, yeah, that actually matches. And let's see that it's the, uh, yeah. So pretty much what's, what's happened there is that now immediately after the new file was created, we read the contents of that file and put that to the same cache, which, now, which is now basically 
uh, being used by our API here to now actually expose and get the data. So now we have this dynamic kind of a, an, an ongoing process where we're able to now get the data and cache it here locally uh, next to the legacy system, provide that in the form of the mini service for the API that we are now publishing in the cloud. And now we also have this kind of an offline functionality, which is now uh, looking for changes in the source data that, that we are basing our cache on. And as soon as some sort of a change occurs here on our, our source data, and the change might even be something that uh, we, we can go in here and, and, and edit this to be something like that. And as soon as we kind of save the file here, that would trigger a new kind of an update of the, of the cache as well. So now whenever the data gets updated, the cache gets kind of invalidated automatically based on the data. And now we're able to access the, the legacy data here. And of course, uh, in this case, if it's CSV, that kind of simplified things us for uh, somewhat. But of course, now you can imagine that using the kind of standard friends uh, functionality or features, you could now just replace the kind of read file here with just about anything. It could be SQL or it could be just uh, your custom task, which is dealing with some weird legacy system or reading directly some sort of a result from a command prompt or, or a PowerShell query or, or any data source that you might think of would follow the similar pattern when you want to actually expose that data in the form of an, in the form of an API. And, and of course, in, in real life situations, uh, things might not be <laughs> as, as kind of easy or, or kind of straightforward as this, but this should give you a fairly good idea on the how to implement these sorts of legacy uh, wrapping or legacy modernization projects where now basically accessing the data here or the, the data in the files is much, much, much more easier for anything, else, anything kind of created after 2010. So mobile apps, web services, whatever, uh, as you can think in the, in the form of the APIs here. But that pretty much concludes our, our webinar for today. So we actually had to skip one part, which was to now create the kind of uh, listing of the all of the different uh, insurance list records here. But otherwise, we, I think we managed, we managed quite nicely. And if some, some of the things here uh, confused you a little bit, so for example, how did we get the uh, agent here, which was now able to access the data locally here on my, my, my server here, be sure to check out our, our help, help documentation here uh, and our previous webinars, which, which explain all of that stuff. In, in more detail, but uh, I, we have two minutes left, and I think it's it's time for me to thank you, thank you all for your time, and and hope to see you on the on the next one. All right, so bye bye. <laughs>